call this meeting to order at 6 p.m. on the 11th of August. Um, motion to approve the minutes. Anybody? I move we approve the minutes. Of the... Uh, I've got a, a couple of comments on the minutes. Oh, One, okay. In, uh, there's a misspelling of what is it, Machulesky Circles? Circle. Mitch Kasky Circle. There should be a W in there someplace, and that isn't. Early. On Mitch Circle, you're saying, Fred? Yeah, yeah, well, whatever. I'll find it. Okay. In, in, the, in the discussion of the uh, cannabis. Form. Yeah. Page one under scheduled appointments. Yep. Yep. And the other thing was in the discussion of the grants from the Complete Streets and for the culvert, there's no mention of what the grants were from. If that could get added, that the that there was it said there was a grant for 168 thousand whatever that didn't say Complete yep. Street grant. Okay, um, Joyce, do you want to amend your motion to include those those uh, edits? Uh, yeah. And I'll I second. take back that old motion. <coughs> Sorry. And I move to uh, approve the minutes as amended. Second. <clears throat> All those in favor, Joyce? Aye. Fred? Aye. Me? Aye. All right. Um, <clears throat> vendor and payroll, payroll warrants. Anybody have any comments? No. Nope. No? All right. Uh, Brian, you're all set on that. Um, is there anybody in the audience who wants to discuss anything that is not listed on the agenda as currently stated? No? All right. Um, hearing none, we will- hey, Jonathan. Yes. Can I, can I just make a comment about the 250th cake lighting and how well that went? Absolutely, you can Jim. something like that for the uh, for the minutes that it was a, a great job by the fire department. And Keith did a great job setting everything up. It was a very good turnout. Great, duly noted. I heard I heard there were hundred people or so there. About two hundred. Seriously, we had two hundred servings of ice cream and had to give away the last five. And there was no doubling up on those ice cream servings? There was some doubling up and there were some people who had none. So I'm assuming about 200 people. All right. Wow. That's great. That's tremendous. Good good news also in terms of amplification of the event there. Um, I, yeah. I was sadly out of town, so I couldn't, as I am most weekends these days, but um, I was sorry I couldn't make it, but that I've, I've heard nothing but great things. And I see a finger being raised. Yes, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, though I'll uh, be on uh, for an agenda item in a little bit, I wanted to be sure that uh, the select board knew that at the Whiteley Library trustees meeting last night, they reported a finding from the library or from the building inspector regarding the library that the storage room titled the Ina Kane room uh, in, on the lower level of the library uh, may no longer be used by the Whateley Historical Society for storage of its materials, which it has done for decades there. Mm. Uh, among other reasons, the oil tank is in that room and the electrical panel is in that room, and so it can't be locked. Um, mm. But so we are going to not only be displaced, we, the Historical Society, but not only be displaced from our major storage facility uh, during the renovations in the library, but permanently. And so we will need to find uh, space, including some that is climate controlled for some of the historical materials that we store there. I have uh, launched an appeal to the five colleges at their library annex uh, in Hatfield uh, for temporary storage as the Hatfield Historical Society had there when their spaces were renovated. But 
we need both dry storage for some materials and climate controlled storage for other materials uh, on a long-term basis. And the shed that we purchased uh, earlier with select board approval uh, is not adequate for either the volume of dry storage nor the climate control that's needed. So we will be in search of a solution to that and climate control spaces are likely to be expensive. Uh, so it's a puzzle that we will have to face. And we may be asking for your help with that. <clears throat> okay. Um, Neil, thank you for the heads up. Uh, I, I know I had no idea. Um, and, and it's good to know that, that that's gonna be an issue that has to be addressed. Um, <clears throat> what I assume would be in the, in the relative near future. Yes, prob uh, it depends on what the uh, five college library annex can provide us on a temporary basis. Uh, so it may, may be as soon as late fall uh, and uh, may not be for a year if we can get the temporary space from, from the five colleges. Uh, we'll keep you posted on that. And, and by climate control, you're also including obviously moisture. Um, that, that's right. We, we need both a, a, a limited temperature variation and pretty stable humidity. Right, right. The humidity, the, the latter seems to be more of a challenge than the former, is my guess. Uh, we'll have to see, right? Most, most systems that can vary temperature have to deal with condensation uh, in right. hot, humid summer weather. And so you would need some sort of dehumidification at least if you don't have a more advanced climate control system. Exactly right. So my, my basement doesn't cut it. Uh, <laughs> Nor mine. Right, exactly. So, okay. Um, good, 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 uh, good heads up. That's, that's good to know. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> with those two public comments um, recorded, um, we can go to scheduled appointments of uh, Gabe. On, to discuss Poplar Hill Road uh, and the speed of vehicles on the road. Um, Greetings to all. How Welcome. are you, Gabe? It's been a while. Hot. Embrace it. Yeah, right. Sounds says future, our future, right? Yep. What do we got? Poplar Hill, speed. The yeah, uh, you know, we, we need some help. Um, I saw Jim uh, earlier this afternoon and, and I can tell that he's interested in speed reduction in general. Um, we have a nice new paved road up here and it's become a speedway. People crest the hill and you know I joke that it's the smoothest road in town. It's wide and smooth and um, it's a straightaway and people fly. There's, you know, there's pandemic speed, then there's, you have to rush to the spiritual destination of the Smith walking trail speed. Whatever it is, it's on the increase. We feel it's a hazard. We need help. And um, I know soon after the new road went in, I had a conversation with Keith in which he mentioned the possibility of um, removable speed bumps uh, speed bumps that would be spring, summer, and fall. And that sounded like a pretty good idea to me. And so we're, we're hoping that uh, that's something that can be considered. I have not spoken to uh, Smith about this. I think Smith underwrote at least part of the road construction. Am I right? Mm -hmm. So you know, part of the predicate of the green building, the McLeish field station, and that whole installation, uh, I was told early on was that it did not alter a neighborhood. And it's definitely having impact on, on us. We have a, a garage that's, it's not on a blind corner, but it's close to the road and there's a bend in the road and people coming down, you know, if they're going at uh, a certain speed, uh, we're in trouble. So something has to be done in, in our opinion. Jim or Keith, has, been, has, has there been a um, traffic count on Poplar Hill Road recently? There has not. That's, I brought the sign up today to, uh, to conduct 
some sort of you know, an informal traffic study. Um, the, the sign that we have doesn't really give us um, 100% accurate information like the FERCOG um, studies would, but it gives us a, a kind of a general idea. It'll give us average speeds over the course of the day. Um, and then it gives us some, some vehicle information, but it, it doesn't distinguish between trucks, cars, bikes, motorcycles, and it doesn't always pick everything up. You know, if, a, if a two cars are going by, it's, it's going to say there's one car type of thing. So it's not going to be 100% accurate information, but it will at least be able to get an idea uh, speed-wise what the average is over the, over the course of a day. So we're hoping to get some information over the next, next week or so on that. I, I mean, I'll lead off, I, and I welcome Joyce and Fred and anyone else, but, um, you know, I, I personally am a proponent of speed bumps, um, and I don't necessarily need them to be three years. I, there, there are, <clears throat> and Keith will shudder at this, but, you know, there are towns across Massachusetts that have four-season speed bumps, um, and the plows figure it out. Um, that being said, you know, people drive too fast on my road, on Christian Lane, on Chestnut Plain Road, we, you know, we, we've had people visit us often um, to discuss speeds. And I think that that speed bumps and perhaps temporary, that's fine. Maybe it would be a lesson learned or something should, should be considered. I don't know what the cost is. I don't know. Uh, I don't know any of that. And, and that's information that, that I would want to know, but I just named three roads and add Poplar Hill as a fourth road that could benefit from speed bumps, in my opinion. Um, and I, I, have, I have very little sympathy for the people who, who have a beef with speed bumps because they, they don't experience the, 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 the traffic and the, and, the, and the high speeds. So that would be my take. But again, I would want more data. Well, we had a concern. I have a concern about the, you know, the gathering of data because I, I got the impression that um, to do this properly, it has to be a, does it have to be a state survey or it has to go to the state? It, it has to be kind of thread its way through. Oh, are we still connected? Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. yep. Um, I see Michael Archibald on my screen. That's all. Uh, oh, there you are. There you are. Um, that it has to kind of thread its way through a process that can take a year or two and, um, you know, that seems like a long time to wait for a remedy. I personally, I think that uh, speed limit signs don't really do the trick. You know, I, I think those markers or the electronic, the digital readouts that you see around uh, here and there are, they really get one's attention. I know Keith has told me that there are some people who look at those and try to see how high a number they can get. I, I don't think we'll have those people up on Poplar Hill, uh, but a speed limit sign, it works for people who are, shall we say law abiding, and for people who don't care or you know think they need to get somewhere faster than most, then I don't think the speed limit signs really are gonna help us too much, but. Mm -hmm. uh, can I just ask a couple questions real quick? You bet. Um, one is the speed limit is posted, I'm assuming, from what you just said. That was going to no, be one. Of no, it's never been posted. And when it was a gravel road, we understood that there couldn't even be a speed limit assigned. Oh, uh, but now that, it's, now that it's paved, I guess it's eligible and for something, but there's nothing now. Yeah, because I think that would be really good for, to, to, for starters, because it could be people just don't know that there is a speed limit there. Um, they should, right? They should have known yeah. that when they passed their driver's ed course but <clears throat> but i think also posting a sign yeah. would be a good idea um because then i think it, when there's no sign posted i think it's problematic to give tickets and i think that's the thing that's really going to stop that seems like a, a hope too far no 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 that, no, no. I, that, that, if, if, that the waitley police are going to be up here doing radar but, but I come back to my original thing, you know, people who look at a speed limit sign, Joyce, and say, oh, I'm, I'm going too fast. So I better slow down. It's the wrong neighborhood. Mm -hmm. that's, what, that's one group of drivers. And then there are drivers who really don't care, you know, speed limit. 
I, I, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. But if there's no speed limit posted, I won't know how fast I can go on your road. And you might think I'm speeding, but I'm not one of the people who don't care. So I think data and information are both really good. Yeah. And I, if we could give the information to people that this is what the speed limit is, I, it's I, quite I, possible with the are, roads that are not posted that they, that they don't know. Yeah. Uh, and that might take care of some of the problem, but I think that I, I, I hear what you're saying about a, like a proper traffic study could take a year to get done, but I don't think we need a proper traffic study to just get an idea of how much speeding is going on there uh-huh. and be able to direct uh, Jim to have some people up there at, at, at whatever time. It wouldn't be a good use of resources to have them up there 24 seven. But the other thing that the sign can tell us is what times of day are problematic. Mm. And so that you can target, you know, you can use, I don't know how many hours uh, a week it would need, but if you target the times when there's more likely to be a problem, then, yeah. then that's a much more efficient I, use of resources. And we don't have that many police officer man hours. So I, I never. So I think the sign would give us the data that we would need for the next decision, which is when should we have the police up there to ticket people? When, when you say sign, do you mean what Jim brought up this afternoon? The, yeah, we have a, a smart sign that can um, both tell people what their speed is and it logs the data. Is, is, is that what came up this afternoon, Jim? Yes. Yeah. Ah. So we have, we have two different signs. We have the, the uh, speed trailer, if you want to call it that, that is mobile. We can move that anywhere in town. And then we have the, the new signs that you see. Uh, there's a few of them around. We still have a couple more to, to put up. Um, but those are mounted to the telephone poles. We use um, the highway department to use the bucket truck and they go up and we kind of secure yeah. them to the, to the telephone pole. Uh, those are, they're not permanent, but they're semi-permanent. Um, they're not easy to move around, like switching places every week. You know, once we put them up there, they kind of stay there for, for a while. And if they come down, we maybe put them somewhere else. Um, those are going to be seasonal mm-hmm. as well. We're probably not going to leave them yeah. up for the, for the winter, mm-hmm. but so those are the two options that we have right now. I, I would agree with Joyce that you know, getting a sign up is the first step, but I think some enforcement, the people yeah. would be my guess, we don't have any data on this, who are doing the, the worst speeding are not the residents in that no. area. No, it, and, and I, I haven't asked our neighbors, I, I see uh, Fran's uh, yeah. name on the array and I think Fran and Nancy, um, who walk the road regularly can speak to the speed that they've encountered up here. I, I just, my guess is that neighbors on Poplar Hill, I don't know if people come up as fast on the hill as they do as they, you know, when they're passing our house, but um, mm-hmm. I, I expect it's pretty, you know, pretty rapid. I, you know, there, there are toddlers on the hill. There are uh, small kids, there are animals, dogs, and uh, it's a, it's not a dense neighborhood, but it's, you know, I, I, I'm not doubting that there are people going there too fast. I'm trying to think, we're trying to, yeah. I'm trying to get at who's doing it. And I don't think it's likely the right. residents of Poplar Hill. No, no, that but are it, going past your house too fast, but absolutely going, not. No, I'm to and from the Smith facility. Yeah, you're absolutely right. But it's, you know, but, as, but as, if you could just give me a minute, yeah, if you do some enforcement, word will get around in the Smith community that you can get a ticket going up there. It, it's so, not, it's not the Smith um, community at all. Oh, it's, it's people who are using the, um, the Smith facility, you know, the well, that's, that's what I mean. If, if the people who are at responsible for the, for getting, for, you know, knowing who's going up there and who's not, or signing in or whatever they're doing, I don't know what the, procedures there are there, there's none of that it, if it can be known word can get out that you can get ticketed on poplar hill okay well you might be right that that would at least <clears throat> should at least help um jim i can't imagine that the the, the um, speed limits more than 25 miles an hour on poplar hill poplar hill road correct 
Well, that that was going to be my <clears throat> my point with the road not being posted. Um, technically, it falls under Chapter 90, Section 17. Um, and that's where they describe a thickly settled area outside of a thickly settled area and divided highways. So the speed limit up there without being posted right now currently is 40 miles per hour. Yeah. Which is obviously way too fast for that road. Hmm. Um, people uh, might not it's, actually it's tough technically to enforce, be speeding. It's tough to enforce something like that <laughs> when that's the speed limit. If somebody's going 40, and that was going to be my question to Gabe is, I mean, you've been driving long enough to, to be able yep. to gauge and have a general idea of how fast you think cars are going are they going 30 are they going 40 are they going 80 no i think they're I, I think they're regularly going 40 and you know we've had some people who you know managed to get past 40 i'm sure okay i think that no matter what what you end up doing there it's going to come down to to enforcement i mean you can put all kinds of signs up and and police vehicles and presence there but it's still going to come out to to enforcement at when people are, are speeding. And for, for Jim to know that, I think it would be worthwhile to do some kind of study with the equipment you have, even though it's not perfect, but use that equipment to identify what times a day, like Joyce, I think was saying, what times a day are, are the most speeders there? So you can devote your resources there because you can't sit there all day. There's other locations in town that have speeding too that I, I know you, you do monitor. Every single so, road. Uh, that you know would help you decide what time of day to be there. And the other thing is is I don't know if there's anything that can be done with with the fines. Whether you when you first stop somebody, is it a warning or is it a fine or whatever? If the fines are are too lenient, people don't care. They're going to still keep speeding and paying the minimal fines. Well, but Fred, it's more than the fine because they also get points on their insurance. I mean, it, it's well, right, it's not- right, but. Yeah. But is it enough to deter people from speeding? So Can I finish that up because yeah. I actually didn't get to my second question. So I guess to, to, to kind of finish that up, we as a select board don't get to decide what the fine is for speeding. All right, that's already settled. So we don't need to discuss it here. And But um, there's one thing, one other thing that I think low hanging fruit, easy to do send a letter to Smith College to the guy who runs the McLeish Field Station. They actually pay attention. They care about good community relations. Mm-hmm. And it may not be, it's not gonna catch everybody, but I think, you know, if it was my house up there and I didn't know about this, I'd really wanna know about it. I'd wanna, you know, and, and tell whoever I can that people are complaining about it because they're they are very they are sensitive to um, what their neighbors think. I just so say this, I, I, I know just it's say- not necessarily going to get everybody, as Gabe is about to say for the fourth time. No, it's but, not actually going to say that for the fourth time, Joyce. But oh, okay. Heard- but yeah, but what? let me finish first. Let me finish. Um, <laughs> but it's low hanging fruit. It seems like the low hanging fruit is figure out what the speed limit ought to be and post it. Get, the sign is already up there. Maybe we can find because if it's if it's really the speed limit is forty miles an hour, I think we're going to find out nobody's speeding. Um, but that forty miles an hour is just not inappropriate. So I don't know how to get the process rolling on figuring out what's the appropriate speed limit and getting it posted. But I think there are people on this call who do know. Go ahead, Gabe. And then, but get the data. Thank, thank you, Jonathan. Um, I. I'm pretty well acquainted with um, the manager of the Smith property. And we know that there are, there are van pools when now that COVID is thawing a little bit and students are again using the facility, we see the Smith vans, they're identified. It's very easy and, and pre-COVID, it was perfectly easy and it made a big difference. If one of us put a call into Smith and asked mm-hmm. the word to be passed, the drivers need to be aware that they're, you know, is in a residential neighborhood and to take care of their neighbors vis-a-vis the speed that they use. A ton of traffic that goes up there are n- people not connected with the college whatsoever. They're there to walk their dogs, to ride their bikes, to walk on trails. They don't log in at the Smith parking lot. I can tell you that that uh, the manager of the McLeish station is on kind of a semi furlough he's there every other week or every other two weeks whatever it is he doesn't have any idea who's 
you know, parking in the parking lot, morning, you know, middle of the day, late afternoon, there's no logging in of drivers. And there are plenty of people who are not connected to Smith. Sorry to say it for the fourth time, but I, I you know, yes, low hanging fruit, but it doesn't, doesn't really solve our problem. I, the, yeah, the, and, the, and just the, to be the, clear. If, if I could just finish, Joyce. Go ahead. The Smith people are responsive and they have been responsive. That's not our problem. No. Okay, and just to be clear, I wasn't saying that that is the entire solution. I proposed four things altogether and only one of them was writing to Smith. One of them was figuring out the right speed limit and posting it. The other was getting data. And the last one was putting our police out there to do enforcement. I suggested four things. And well, I think that is a really good start. We started with one thing, a hoped for look at the possibility of speed bumps. That's not in your collection. I, I don't know that much about those. I don't know how much they cost. Um, I haven't heard from our highway department guy on that, but I, I'm happy to listen about that as well. But can because we hear the other four things, I think we can get rolling really quickly. Could we hear from Keith on that question? Keith, go ahead. As far as cost, that I, I cannot tell you. Um, I have not researched what like removable ones would cost. The only few things that I had done, and this was like a year or so ago, was um, I had spoken to uh, somebody in Northampton, I've forgotten now who it was because so long ago about the ones in Northampton and asked how they were. And the one thing I did get was that the, the most complaints they got from them being in place were the neighbors adjacent to them because they make so much noise and vehicles going over them. Because every time something goes over with loose, like a pickup truck with loose things in it, even if they're not speeding, it's going to make a loud, loud noise. And it's very, in some cases, very um, new, uh, much of a nuisance. And especially at nighttime, if you have your windows open, that's one thing I got out of it. But again, I can, I can certainly look into um, cost of removable ones to see what they would cost and try to get information from other towns that have used them to see how they work. We don't have much night traffic up here, I'm happy to say. So I, I, I think getting more information on the speed bumps is a great idea. I think having the sign up there that, that was put up there, I guess, earlier today is a, is a great start. I think sending the letters is, is something that should happen right away. <clears throat> um, I, I guess my question that I'm wondering, Jim, is, is it really, a, I don't want to avoid data, but I know that 40 miles an hour is too fast for that road. I know it is. I don't need data to tell me that. I may need data to tell me what speed is, is, is appropriate, but I know 40 miles an hour is, is, is too fast. I live on a road that 35 is the speed limit, and I think that's too fast. So I, I honestly don't believe that we need data to tell us that 40 is too fast. My question is, is it a year long process to change the speed to anything beyond what the state mandates for unposted or can the select board set a speed limit on a whim? And I'm gonna be, and I'm being flippant there, but I'm asking it just to, to prove a point. What's the process? Yeah, so the, the process for setting a speed limit, it starts off with a, a in-person traffic study. So there's a log that we have and we have to sit up there for a certain amount of time, certain times of the day, and we have to count each vehicle that goes through there and we have to document the speed of the vehicle. Then the state does their own traffic study and then the engineers get involved and they look at the width of the road, the condition of the road. They look at all those factors, they, they compile everything together and then they come up with what they feel the speed limit should be. Once they determine what the speed limit is, that's what the speed limit is. Uh, the speed limit could be 30, it could be 40. Once it's posted, that's what the speed limit is. And, and we can't enforce it no, under that. The town has no say on a on clearly a town road what the speed limit is going to be. No. That is state bureaucracy at its finest. <clears throat> yeah, there, there's some there's some things 
there's some things in the law about thickly settled areas. We talked about it before about being able to post 25 mile an hour speed limits, but we don't have any thickly settled areas. So, so it works because the of- laws are written for people in suburban and, and, and urban areas, not for rural areas. Yes, I agree. But I agree. so, so the, the challenge that I see, and I, I'm, I'm happy to have people push back is that, <clears throat> excuse me, um, I'm all for speed bumps, but speed bumps are going to defeat the purpose of trying to figure out what the correct speed limit is because it's going to impact driving habits. So I, I, other than the sign, having some police posted up there when it's administratively effective and communication with Smith, what else? <clears throat> if we want the, the, the actual data, we can't impact driving patterns by, by my sense. Maybe I'm wrong. Could I ask uh, just a couple of quick questions? Is the aspect of Smith as an educational institution, you know, kids, uh, college kids up there doing whatever, does that have any bearing on what an approach to the facility uh, could be, what speed limit could be designated for, for such an area, you know, where there's educational satellite? That's one question. The other question is, can we get one of those pole mounted things sometime, even if it's temporary? I, 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 I think that's to you, Jim, perhaps. Super pricey. Yeah, I mean, we, we currently have five of the signs um, and we've identified, um, I know Brian and Keith have worked on identifying areas within the town um, yeah. for grant purposes and things like that. So we've identified um, five areas or five roads in the town where we wanted to put the signs to initially to start off. Um, so that's where we're looking at those five signs. Uh, they're about $3,000 per sign. Ouch. Um, I know <clears throat> Hatfield, they've had, a, I think they have two signs that they have that um, the people in the community, uh, people on the road, they all pitched in and they donated the money to the town to purchase mm-hmm. the sign. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, that's an option. I mean, if somebody were to you know, donate the money if, if there's no plan for raising funds from the from the town's perspective. Um, if there was a donation, I mean, we could certainly put up the sign and, and maintain it and and track the data and so on and so forth. Um, that's that's another option. Um, it's not mm-hmm. strictly limited to just law enforcement only can purchase it. Um, Jim, you said that you thought there was a fairly significant effect of having one of those signs up, though, when we spoke earlier today. Yeah, no. I, whether it's whether it's a pole mounted sign or whether it's the the actual speed sign, um, yeah. I think there there's there are studies out there that show that you know the a lot of the people that when they do see the sign, it's a reminder for them that mm-hmm. hey, check your speed because this is the speed limit and this is how fast you're going. Yeah. And then they realize they're going a little bit fast, so they so they slow down. You know, the people that are going 60, 70 miles an hour down some of our roads, they don't care that there's a sign there. They, they continue to speed regardless of what the sign says. So there are portions of the population that are going to pay attention to a, a speed limit sign. There's portions that will pay attention to a lit up radar sign. And there's people that aren't going to pay attention at all. So, yeah. so it's difficult to say which, which one's going to be most effective. If yeah. I could just point out one, one additional thing as far as the speed limit goes in enforcement. Right now... Um, if the speed limit technically is 40 miles per hour, um, we can all sit here and say that we don't think that it should be 40 miles per hour, but that doesn't give me an enforcement option unless somebody's going over 40 miles per hour. Mm-hmm. If they're going over 40 miles per hour under that chapter and section, it's a $105 fine regardless of how fast they're going. With the posted speed limits, you have to add Ten dollars for every mile per hour over the speed limit that they are. So that's when the faster they're going, the larger the fine. Without the speed being posted, it's one hundred five dollars, and that's as much as we can charge for a fine that's set, set by the state. So if they're going sixty miles an hour down your street, it's still only going to be one hundred and five dollars. It's not going to be, you know, a three hundred dollar ticket. Yeah. So, so, that, so Joyce, the, the four items that you mentioned the letter, the police being up there, if, if for no other reason than visibility, if they can't, if they find everyone's going 39, 
what were the other two again? Remind us because I want I want to I want to pay attention oh. to this, but I also want to be cognizant of time. Get the ball rolling on getting a, a speed posted there. And I understand that might take a little while. Yeah. Um, I didn't know the process as well as the uh, that, Jim or Keith. Just that requires it. a letter to the state for this from the. Select that would be a letter to the state, Jim. It requires a letter from the select board to the state to request the process begin. Yeah. Okay, then let's request that process begin. I, I agree. Yeah. Yeah, Fran, what were you going to say? Yeah, I did, uh, I don't want to prolong this topic too much, but I can say one thing. I think maybe two would help. Um, it's having the sign that says dead end actually on Poplar Hill Road. So people whiz by that and they go up there, up the hill here, right in front of the house and Gabe's house. And they come zooming right back down because they missed that sign. That sign is not facing the direction of Poplar Hill. If, if you can change that slightly, Keith, so it right in their face there, that would, I think, cut maybe in half the number of people going up there by mistake. Second thing, um, I noticed on Lower Conway Road, which is unpaved, the, some neighbor down there put up their own uh, slow the heck down sign, um, which is lovely. <laughs> I don't know if we can just throw one of those up there too in the interim, but I think that would be helpful if we have to wait for a official sign to show up. Um, I would add to that, and I and I think we should have it unless it's already there. Um, mm -hmm. Is is you know Gabe mentioned that there are children living on the road, and I think you you define them as toddlers. So we mm -hmm. could get a children at play sign, uh, or ch slow children, or, or or whatever the appropriate signage might be. I think I think that oftentimes speaks volumes because we've all had kids or been kids at one point in our lives, mm -hmm. and I and I do think those signs are as effective as as any sign is going to be, short of a hundred and five dollar speeding ticket. Mm -hmm. um, Fred, you were going to say? Yes, yeah, uh, this, I agree. This. I think we should just start the process on you know seeing what the speed limit should be because I'm a little worried that putting up a sign where it says the speed limit is 40, we're going to get people going 40 and 45 who are now going 30. Yeah, we, can't, we can't post a 40 mile per hour speed limit sign. Yeah. We can't post it. And, 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 and as would, it, Jonathan, would, would, would it be on the, on the electronic board though, if you said speed limit is no. It just, right now it just says, please drive safe. And then it shows your speed. But does it flash if you're going faster, like the one in Sunderland on 116? Um, not not the speed, not the radar, uh, the trailer that we have. It just displays your speed. Because the one in Sunderland on 116, if you're going over 40, yep. it flashes 41. That's, that's what our pole mounted signs do. Yeah. Okay. They turn red and they flash and they do all kinds of things. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Rowoski. Yeah. I like to say this uh, similar problem came up on Long Plain Road. Oh, three, four months ago, and we asked FERCOG to do a speed, and I think it was classification study, a long plain road in the vicinity of the school, because there were its neighbors complaining, uh, they were <clears throat> going fast, and especially with kids out in the playground area, and also that is a route for commercial truck traffic to go to the auction there, the animal auction on Tuesdays. FERCOG did a study. I saw the equipment out there in early June. We asked they do it while school was still in session. I think it was June or maybe into May. What is what has happened with that study? Is anything conclusive come out of that or is it still being looked at? I mean, that's the same kind of thing you're asking here for, I guess, Poplar Hill, if you're going to get involved in a study. Jim or Keith, what, what has happened with that study on, on Long Plain Road? We did get some data back on that. Um, I don't think it's been analyzed by anybody. I don't think it's come up in a, in a meeting or anything like that, but I know we did get a report. Okay. Um, they did Long Plain Road. They did uh, Chestnut Plain Road, the, more towards the south end of Chestnut Plain. Um, so there's a couple of, couple of different spots on there as well. So we do have those traffic studies. So, so Fred Barron and Joyce, um, is, it, is it fair to ask, and I'm gonna try to summarize, and if I miss something, please, let me know that I'm misremembering. Um, but a, a letter to Smith officials 
um, a letter to the state office of safe, public safety uh, or whomever Jim tells us is appropriate to get the the speed study started. Um, Keith is going to do a, <clears throat> an, an assessment of cost of speed bumps. Um, again, I would like a children at play sign put up there or slow children something. What am I, I know I'm missing one of the steps that would be easy to implement, I think. I think um, it was just the, having the sign, the equipment we have up there yeah. and getting some idea of when to have some enforcement. Right, which I, which I believe is up there already. It's so. up there, and so we'll be gathering some data. And I think also Fran's idea of getting that dead end sign mm. situated appropriately. Yeah. So can we do all those? I don't think this requires a vote. I just think this is a please go forth and do these things, Brian. Uh, Keith, you, oh, Keith or Jim, do you know if there's a cost to the mass DOT study, the mass DOT request? No. No. There's no, you don't know, or there's no cost. There is. I don't. No cost, and um, if you all remember that the uh, FERCOG had offered to assist with the um, this assessment because they now have some equipment, so the burden may be able to be spread out between Waitley Police and FERCOG and getting the assessment done, and at the same point in time. We also need to get the um, Upper Conway, as I like to refer to Upper Conway portion, the paved portion, we need to get that determination done because one of the things that we're going to have happening with the complete streets is the was traffic coming at the intersection of Williamsburg Road and Conway Road. And we need to have a speed limits on Conway Road to make that effective. And if Conway Road is not posted, then we're right back to the fact of cars going by Paul Newland's house at 40 miles an hour, we all agree is too fast, but so we need that also answered. Okay. Can we, Brian, can we put you in charge of making sure all these things actually happen? So we want to, we want to do both Upper Conway, we want to make requests for both Upper Conway and uh, Poplar at the same time then. Essentially, yeah, we want to submit two requests. I, I, Joyce and Fred can chime in. I don't see why we wouldn't. Yeah. I, I guess. Just one last quick question. The study done by the state, if it results in, um, I think Fred Barron raised this point, if it results in the proper speed being assessed as a 40 mile an hour speed limit, uh, that doesn't really help our cause. I mean, I think Jonathan immediately recognized that that's not appropriate for our neck of the woods. Are we stuck with that if that's what results from the state study? So you're asking, is there an appeals process? No, I'm asking if it's in stone, if it comes back, you need to post that at 40. That, that's my point. I mean, would there be an appeals process to that to that edict from above? Well, not necessarily to lower it, but do we, we would we have to abide? I mean, would we see a 40 MPH uh, speed limit sign go up on Poplar Hill? We, we're not obliged that, to put up a sign. I think that process, the, the process isn't just for posting a speed limit. It's, it's, it's for certifying that as a town road with this being the speed limit. So it's a it's kind of a certification process, not just a speed limit posting if I'm understanding that correct, Keith. Gotcha. Because that's well, I, 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 road, we do the same same thing and then they post it. Yeah, I, I have to run. I just want to thank you all for giving this a good hearing and uh, everything you're, you all are saying makes good sense. We're just, um, when it's ongoing, you know, we want to tear our hair out and it's very, very random. I think uh, Fran could, if he's still there, could attest to that. There's no rhyme or reason to when the, the, the fast flow is. It, it, it's just, you know, you'd be wasting your time sitting and waiting for somebody. It's, um, okay. it's okay. Yeah. Thank you all very much. Appreciate it a lot. Take care. Have a great night. You too. All right. Um, we're on to a topic that I thought was in our rear view mirror, but clearly it is not. Um, face coverings. Fran, oh, you want to? We, go we need right. to do uh, the Waitley Historical Society first. 2021 Fall Festival. I, I apologize. Um, <clears throat> Neil, is that back to you? 
Well, I suppose I submitted the normal application uh, for use of the town hall. I don't know uh, whether the Waitley Historical Society has ever applied for permission to have its fall festivals, uh, which have been <laughs> variously at the center school uh, in some years and most recently at the town hall. But I included that in my request. And in the interest of full disclosure, we want to be outside, uh, want to be able to open the town hall, let people use the bathrooms, allow whatever is the, um, the Board of Health advice with regard to limited uh, visitation of the museum to see the objects in the museum. Uh, we're not planning to bring the fall festival indoors, uh, but we also wanted to reserve the auditorium and the community room to avoid there being competing events uh, in the town hall during the, the festival, which is essentially outdoors with some cooked food and some demonstrations uh, so uh, Brian thought it appropriate to refer this request to the select board. So I don't know what your process is for uh, reviewing our uh, request. Um, I, I think the three of us can either say thumbs up or thumbs down and <coughs> that's our review process, Neil. Um, <clears throat> okay. Again, I don't, I, I, I think it's great. I, I, you know, maybe I'm unique, but I don't think so. Fred, Joyce. I don't think you're unique, John. No, nope, you're not unique <laughs> in this regard. <laughs> There's a vote. <laughs> no. You set yourself up for that one. I though, did. Didn't you? You're right. No, I was just thumbing through your application here on my screen. Um, and uh, I guess the, if you really have to reserve the, I'm looking at the, where's that table? Um, the auditorium and the meeting room, that seems like kind of a substantial cost. Is that? Um, Why is that a cost? Why is that? Yeah, they're Waitley residents. They would get to use that for free. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. I read the table incorrectly. Sorry. Um, I take that. I take that. My one worry was, was that, and I completely uh, take it back. Um, yeah, I, I know this, form, this has been less formal in the past, but it fits on the form. I yeah. think it's great. <clears throat> Fred, you got a beef? None at all. Okay. Neil, it's all you. So, so let me then just ask uh, two other things. If there was an interest in spilling out partially into the parking lot, uh, is that a problem? Uh, I mean, we can avoid it. We can go to other sides of the town hall and uh, mm. I hope the ground will have firmed up where the Veterans Park is going in. If not, we can go a little bit further down uh, the street. Um, so, so I think we have options, but is it possible to block off, say, three spaces mm. uh, at the uh, southern edge of the parking lot? What, what um, time is this at again? It'll be midday, 11 to 2. Oh, on a Sunday. On a Sunday. I'm okay. I'm okay shutting down the parking lot from 11 to 2, and then it opens up for the Waitley Inn. Well, well, but then we need some places for people who are coming to park. They can park at the library. They can park in the in the spaces mm -hmm. on the side of Chestnut Plain Road. But yeah. having yeah. some of those parking spaces open seems to be a good thing for attendance. I, I would say block off the parking spaces on the south side, on the town hall side, four or five spaces. Yeah, and or whatever you need there. Yeah. You're talking about, it sounds like maybe a third of the entire parking area. Oh, probably less, like maybe, a, maybe a quarter yeah. of the entire parking area. Right. I'm just thinking for public safety, cordon off all the ones that are right in front of town, the town offices or the town hall, excuse me. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Right up to the driveway yes. and call it a day. Yeah, I, I would have no trouble with that. Yeah. Neil, I would suggest you coordinate with the veterans in town because they're planning a, a, a ceremony or dedication of a new veterans monument in the center of town. The last I heard was November around uh, is it Veterans Day. I don't November know. November 11th. That, yeah. With, with your, your schedule, but I, I guess coordinate with them. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Jim? Uh, just a, a quick question about the 
parking there. Um, from what I remember, I, I thought there was an agreement with, with the Waitley Inn that if the town needed to use some of their parking for some reason, they, they could, uh, just as the Waitley Inn can use the town hall parking. I mean, is that an option? Could somebody reach out to the Waitley Inn and maybe park over there instead? Well, certainly the, all the parking on the Waitley Inn's lot that is closest to the road is all the town's property anyways and we paid to have that repaved ourselves <clears throat> so yes by all means he has no right to exclude us from using it but again i don't think that that chip would would do that so i no. you know i mean he's been a, he's been such a great neighbor all along so <clears throat> but i think giving him a heads up that the event's going to be taking place is a, is a great idea and um and and let him know that 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 uh, people may be maybe you know it, it'll be a, a crowded area up until two o'clock and then it'll be a typically uncrowded area. Yeah. So I'd be happy to reach out to Chip. Okay. Anything else, Neil? Nope. Then we are going to move forward. Um, and thank you, Neil, for for all you do. By the way. Um. All right. Now, Fran. Or and or Brian, whoever wants to kick this off. I'll volunteer, Fran. Once he unmutes. Go ahead, Fran. You're muted. Well, I assume Brian shared some of the information about what we we're recommending, and um, it's pretty straightforward. It's a recommendation to uh mask uh, um strongly advise mask wearing indoors in all public buildings at this point the covid case counts are rising and um we are just being cautious as a precautionary step measure to keep it keep the levels as low as possible for cases and one of the best ways to do that for vaccinated and unvaccinated is to mask up inside. So, and you've probably noticed in the papers and elsewhere that a lot of towns around us are doing either mandates for masking inside or uh, a similar recommendation to ours that uh, all users of public spaces indoors be masked. So, that's a, so it's a strong mm -hmm. recommendation, Fran. It's not a, a, a mandate. Not yet. And hopefully never, <laughs> but we'll see. Right. There's no guarantees for this and things change, as you know. So, but <clears throat> I think our the board has um, come to this uh, recommendation because we see what's going on and as everybody else does, and it's just wiser to be... Um, take a precautionary step now, I think. Things will change, hopefully for the better, but until that happens, I think this is uh, a wise move. My question, my only question would be, um, and I know you get, you've got a meeting scheduled for next week, which I assume includes the elementary schools, but it may be just be for the, for the high school. Um, how does this impact Whaley Elementary School in your mind? Uh, personally, uh, the board hasn't discussed oh, it per no. se, but um, I think uh, we're going to recommend, particularly since kids don't, or kids under 12 and K through 6 don't have any uh, vaccine options, that masking be required in schools. And that's, you know, we're just following CDC guidelines, basically. Um, same with the <laughs> recommendation that we just mentioned. And that only makes sense because there, there is no vaccine yet for kids yet. They are gonna be required to be in person at this point. So um, in terms of masking, that would be our, I think our recommendation to the school boards. And we'll be making that next week. I'm, I'm sure we're not gonna be alone in that recommendation. I don't know, other measures, maybe three foot distancing like last year and um, uh, and I don't mean the indoor masking just for school, but also buses. 
at some point, I would like to see in when vaccines do become available for kids, that there may be a option for in-school vaccination clinics. I know they resist that, but maybe we can find uh, nurses that would do that just to make it easier. I'd, I'd be all for that one. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're, you're going to suggest requirements for one public school building and recommendations for the, the rest? Yeah. Well, one okay. is... I think that that's I'm actually... Sorry, public, building, doesn't... Well, public building and then recommendation for the rest of the public buildings. Mm -hmm. okay. At this yeah. point. Yeah. yeah. As, um, I don't know if my question is for Brian or for Fran, but um, because it's not a mandate, we don't have to get into the nitty gritty details of, well, if a person is alone in their office with the door closed, they don't need a mask and that sort of thing. Because this is a, a recommendation, it means the person can use their judgment. And if they're alone in their office with the door closed, then that could be their judgment that they don't need a mask at that moment. Yes. For example, because that's a lot of the, a lot of the places that have mandates do have that kind of an exception. Yeah, I think where, um, where a person is in an office by themselves, um, that as we did in the past, that they could go yeah. mask, obviously, especially yeah. if they're vaccinated and they're not yeah. in contact with uh, unvaccinated folks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's the key difference with the schools is that the, mm -hmm. the unvaccinated population is so much bigger there than it would be at any given time in our town offices. Right. I, I, I'll just add that that the current um, COVID-19 policy that we have in place that was that the board adopted at the end of June required masking when people could not keep six uh, six feet of distance um, inside, indoors. So I, that has not been, that has not changed. Okay. That has not changed. Okay. Right. The board has not voted to change that. And I, I don't, I don't think that we would want to change that at this point. No way. Okay. Anybody got any comments? Chief? I, I just have one, one question, maybe best for Brian. Um, so our inventory currently is pretty solid, but moving forward, do we have funding sources for uh, additional PPE, um, masks, and gloves? Because we are, we are running a little bit low on some sizes of gloves. Those are getting used a lot, but um, masks are pretty set right now, but I just wanted to check and see if we had a funding option for. Yeah, yeah, we can talk about that. We still have some remaining CARES Act monies left. Okay. Uh, that we can we can spend before I think it's December thirty first of, of this year. Okay. And then I, I also believe that some of the uh, coronavirus local fiscal recovery fund monies that we're going to be getting from the federal government is that would also be an eligible expense. Okay. So. Yeah, it might um, be something we want to. We should touch, touch, touch base on that. Yeah, before it gets to the point where we have no options to get the stuff anymore. <laughs> right, and and although we're probably we or they are probably late in this respect, that if we should also reach out to the schools and see if they need to if they need anything else. But I'm sure the hundreds of thousands of schools across the country have are placing orders or have placed orders. So. We'll see how our supply chain does again. We, we should also find out what um, SCEMS has in their stock, just so we know what's out there in the world. Uh, um, this is Becky. Um, Fran, don't we have a lot still for in the Board of Health, a lot of PPE? Well, it's actually consolidated in over in the, our depot with the police station. Oh, so okay. Oh, okay, so it's all- We, we have- okay. um, I think we have plenty of masks, right, Jim? Gloves may be running in short supply. And I have a box, a, we have a small box in the Board of Health, actually it's not that small, but um, maybe there's another 200 masks or something or, or more. Yeah, I did I did get a request for, for some masks for the library as well. Mm -hmm. Have them available for people that are visiting the library. So yeah, masks, masks right now aren't a concern. Um, Hand sanitizer, we're we're in pretty good shape. Um, we do have a, a disinfectant sprayer, a fogger that that we use on the cruisers and the police station. Um, we can use that anywhere, any any of the buildings in town. Um, but like I said, as far as gloves, we have we have gloves 
we got a, a large supply of gloves that were more for cleaning. They're a lighter weight glove. Um, and we've, we've gone through a lot of our um, heavyweight gloves, going to medical calls and crashes. Pretty much every call we go on, we're, we're gloving up still. So, so those are going fairly, fairly quickly. And those are a little bit more expensive than just cleaning. So Brian, is there anything we need to do as a board to embrace the recommendations of, um, of the Board of Health? Yeah, I think it would be good if, if the board took a, a form of vote on it on on an advisory state. We'll call it an advisory statement. I had sent one out um, just this afternoon. So I I was suggesting in the bold here, mm -hmm. um, and we can wordsmith it as we need. All persons, regardless of vaccination status, are strongly encouraged to wear a face covering when inside town or Whitley public buildings. Okay. Um, so that's would, what we, you would need us to vote on. Can I? Can we add per the recommendation of the of, of, of the Board of Health and 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 medical experts, so that it's not just the uh, select board stating things on high. So you want me to write? I, yeah. I, I would well, add the Board of Health. I don't know medical experts adds much. Well, the CDC has recommended it, and they're pretty expert. But the Whitley Board of Health is fine if people, I mean, I just, again, these are guidelines put out by the CDC. And if we're going to trust the science, we should trust CDC. I mean, that's going to, so I suspect that will fluctuate. And I don't know if Fran has an opinion on that. I, I think the the county's probably going to fluctuate in and out, right, based on cases in terms of substantial and, and mm. whatever moderate transmission, I imagine, because um, it's based off a, a, a per 100,000 number. Um, right. But, okay. uh, That's fine. Just leave it at Board of Health. That's fine. Okay. Do I hear a motion? Uh, I would move that we accept this advisory statement. Let's Second. Second. Okay. Um, all those in favor to uh, create an advisory statement that says, per the recommendation from the Whitley Board of Health, all persons, regardless of vaccination status, are strongly encouraged to wear a face covering when inside town of Whitley public buildings. Uh, Joyce. Aye. Fred. Aye. Me. Aye. Brian, who would this be distributed to directly, specifically? Um, beyond just a general posting. Yeah. I have this, I have an email group that I send out to the, it's the best contact group that I have of all users of the town offices. I would send that out and then we would post it. And I, the library, I assume also. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. They're on that as well. Um, yeah. That we'll, we'll get, yeah. We don't want to get into discussions between library <laughs> trustees roles and responsibilities and select responsibilities, but yes, it will get sent to them. Yeah. And, would, the and, post, and, would the post office be included? Sorry to interrupt, I'm in my car. Um, would the post office be included in that? No, no, the select board doesn't have any authority over the post office. Okay, thanks. But, but they, they might post it. I mean, they've uh, been accommodating in the past. So with something like this, we might just ask them. Yeah. Becky, understand. if you want to do that. So, so if we're, sure, it, yeah, I could check it. it yeah, if we're going to get into who has authority over non-municipal establishments, I guess that's going to that's going to flow more towards the board of health, I think, right. um, in terms of advisories and postings mm -hmm. and things like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's a, I note that there's already signage that Brian has drafted. It was based on a recommendation in most of the buildings, right, on the doors of most of the public buildings. Yeah, when I talked when when we got your your recommendation, I conferred with Jonathan about what to do in the interim. Yeah, that's good. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, thank you to the Board of Health for your always due diligence and 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 care and compassion. Um, thank you. But I think we can now move thank on to guys. the next topic on the agenda. Okay. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, you guys. Yeah. Bye now. Um, Letters of support previously submitted special legislation on behalf of 
Gary Stone, Bill Smith, and Edwin Zanuski. Uh, Brian? Yep. So we've submitted home rule petitions to allow those individuals to work past the age of 65. Um, so the, the legislation gets submitted to uh, Rep. Lay, and she drafts um, our request gets submitted to Rep. Lay, and she drafts the legislation, introduces it. Um, it's in committee. Um, the committee um, made some changes to it, which the select board is being requested to approve um, for all three of these. And you have the letters in your packet. Um, uh, for Bill Smith, it's just adding um, that this shall take effect upon its passage. Um, Gary Stone, there's some additional language from the, uh, we call it P uh, PRAC is essentially the Public Employees Retirement Administration Committee that was added um, to just clarify um, some retirement um, issues there. And then uh, the same for Edwin Zaneski. So um, I don't have any issues with what they're asking us to add. So we would, we have to send proof that the, if the select board so approves, we have to send proof that the select board approves. Um, so now is John frozen or am I frozen? I think good. John looks frozen. Hmm. Hey, Brian, while, while he's thawing out, <laughs> do we have any timeline on that? No, I didn't think so. <laughs> um, so if, if we're going to approve these, it would be a motion. Um, we, we should probably do individual motions um, okay. to accept the language as stated in, in the letter that was provided. Um, oh, okay. Okay, well, then um, <laughs> waiting, for, waiting for John, I'll, I'll make a motion to approve the, the language for Officer Zanuski. Um, and I'll second that. And since the chair is gone, uh, can I take over now <laughs> as vice chair? Okay. I'll take over as vice chair. Um, and uh, I would call them for, uh, I, is there any further discussion? Okay. Um, then uh, we'll take a roll call vote. Um, uh, those in favor, oh. Fred? Yes. Uh, me? Back. Yes. Jonathan, I'm back. I'm back. Technology is great when it works. Mm -hmm. uh, Ah. Okay. Okay. I was just going to say roll call vote, John. We're voting on Ed Zaneski was the first one, right? Yep. Yep. Okay. Okay. Uh, Joyce, why don't you finish this since you started it? Okay. All right. I'd entertain a motion on uh, the next one. I move we approve the letter regarding Bill Smith. Uh, I'll second that. Is there any further discussion? Okay, hearing none, I'll do a roll call vote. Fred? Yes. Uh, John? Yep. Me? Yep. Okay. Uh, maybe maybe I'll let John make the motion this time. Who's left? Okay. Gary Stone. Uh, Gary Stone, right? Gary Stone, make a motion to accept the, the uh, letter for special legislation for Gary Stone. Uh, Second. Okay, uh, any Gary further discussion? No, sorry. Okay, hearing none, I'll roll call vote. I'll go to John first this time. Yep. Fred? Yes. Me? Yep. Uh, okay, I'm, I can turn it back to our chair. Then. Sorry about that, you guys. I, I oh, no problem. No problem. Um, uh, Waspin audio video, Brian? Yep, so this has been, this has been in the works for a while. Um, and it's a uh, proposal to outfit uh, this conference room with um, essentially um, conferencing technology um, and also replacing the uh, quite outdated projector that we have. Um, I, I don't remember how long ago this was, probably four months ago, Amy and I had an initial meeting with, with I think his name was Felipe from, from Wasman and he came in. We had a socially distanced meeting in here to talk about about different ways that um, we could add to our technology here. 
And then we had a follow-up meeting, uh, myself, Amy, and Joyce, right? I think Joyce, yep. Joyce was, was with us. And we were reviewing their proposal and we had uh, asked them to make some other changes. Um, so this is a proposal that we have. It's something that I think we should move forward with. Um, let me just, I'll just share my screen real quick. Here real quick, right? Um, You'd think I'd never done this before. I was going to say, Brian, it's an outstanding presentation you just made. How many uh, how many months have we done this? <laughs> there we go. Let's look at pictures because we like pictures. So they're recommending for, so we're looking at camera, we're looking at uh, screens, and uh, new projector. Um, so this is the conference room that we're looking at right now. Um, this is the front table. And these are, this is, so this is the U table that we usually have. Projectors back here, the logos back here, the flags are back here, doors over here. Um, when we had people, they used to sit back here. Um, so what's being recommended is an Owl Pro uh, camera that would sit right in the center of the U here. Um, it would be controlled and connected to a laptop. And we would have uh, two flat screens on laptops, uh, two flat screens on carts here, one facing the board, one facing uh, the people in attendance. And it would uh, operate through Zoom. So this would be used for uh, initially for a hybrid meeting. And we'd also want it to be able to connect out with, um, connect out to FCAT. So we could also, also push out that feed live um, whenever that happens, right? Mm -hmm. Um, but we have a, we have a, a conference call scheduled with, with Comcast in two weeks, a week, 20th, yeah, I, I think, remember which, yeah. um, to hopefully pu push that forward. Um, so that's what, that's what they're recommending. The Owl Meeting Pro, it's a 360 degree camera and, um, Joyce and Amy and I had a demo of it. I think it's, it, it works pretty good for what we're looking for. It provides a 360 degree view. Um, of the room, and it, it has different uh, spot, uh, spotlight uh, spotlight cameras. Certain people who are talking through technology that's beyond my comprehension. Um, so I, I think it would be um, a good investment for us. I know that there's been some difficulties with hybrid meetings currently, um, and I've experienced those as well. Um, and I think this would be a good solution. It's it's a it's a popular solution. I I was on a uh, a webinar, and I think Fred may have also been on it. Yeah, I was on it. Um, to see what other communities have been doing um, for remote meetings and hybrid meetings. Um, the 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 ones that have a lot of money have these whole studios created, and it's fabulous. And they have two two staff people each night that work on it, and it's this big. It's a big to do. Um, we we don't have that luxury, so. I think this is a reasonable solution. This is paid for out of um, out of uh, cable access money, though, correct? So there's a couple. I think there's a couple opportunities. Um, one, I, I think we could pay for it out of CARES Act. I think we could say that it's a it's a response um, to COVID. But yeah, also one of the options is is the peg access capital monies that we get from Comcast. I, I don't. I mean. Yeah, the peg access money is is we've always sat on that money for capital expenses. Um, we don't know what the future for CARES Act demands are going to be. I, I don't I don't see any reason why we wouldn't use the peg access um, uh, budget that we that we currently sit on to to pay for this. That's that was the plan all along. How how big a pot of money is that at this point? Um. It's somewhere between forty five thousand and fifty thousand dollars, right? And it, and it can't be used for anything beyond the, these purposes. Well, so it can I, be used for things other than equipment. 
it can be used for um, just, you know, for paying people to do peg access related things. But yeah, you're oh, so great. We, so we could do the whole thing with the two people in the booth. Like, <laughs> not for very long. We can't now. even afford the booth. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. Yeah, forty to fifty thousand dollars is not enough to do that. Uh, to do that. But, no, I, um, I wasn't saying that we yeah. need it. it was just. And I, I was going to go back and look at the the you price tag that like, took over my 8, screen. Eighty five hundred or nine thousand or something. There we go. Or did I miss it? Yeah, it's it's. I think it's just a little over eight thousand with uh, everything. Yeah, and that yeah. includes that optional monitor or whatever that. What was the optional equipment? I don't know that anything we wrote here was. Oh, option. Oh, something the up above. It was the projector, right? We could. Oh, okay. Um, I th I think that was it was the projector. Additional options. Yeah, it was the projector. Right. The projector we have works, um, but it's it's not work. It's it's getting up there yeah. in age. Let's put it that way. Yeah, and the resolution would mean that yeah, it's not very useful for say projecting a spreadsheet onto the wall so that everybody in the room can see it. It's not going to have enough resolution to do that very well. So it's a good time to upgrade, and the projection the cost is not very is not huge but it does uh, include the um 55 inch screen correct right yeah Two of them. oh hold on there's yeah. something i don't understand about the oh so the additional options there would bring it up to ten thousand something right because the to that total down at the bottom doesn't include the two thousand for the new projector is that correct brian yeah there was something it was on an option optional. online for optional down below Oh, okay. okay. No, it is. It is concluded. In the, I thought it was included. included in, yeah. In the 8589, 8589 does include yes. the optional yeah. things. Sorry, I misspoke earlier. So, so the, 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 the thing that I saw above optional for $2,200 or something, that is included in this. Yeah. Uh, in projector. the grand total number on the bottom right. Right. Yeah, correct. Yeah, That's, yeah, yeah. I just wanted to make sure. Okay. I, I will caution that 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 they hold prices for 90 days and this is outside 90 days. So the, the bottom line number may be a little bit different, but I don't I don't think it'd be tremendously different. Yeah. I'm sure it probably went down. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Brian, I have one question about the configuration. Can you go back to the diagram of the room? Yep. Joyce's questions for you then. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how, this one? Yeah, that one. Oh, how I'll high would the monitors in the middle of the room be? You they say they're going to be on a cart. They're on a uh, cart, but the cart is low to the ground. Um, okay, Brian, I just want to make sure the people who, when we get back to having a live audience, right. that people will still be able to see the people sitting at yeah, the front Yeah, I think there's yeah, a better right picture here. on the next page if Brian can scroll down. I can do that much. So uh, can you see those carts? They're kind of low to the ground. Um, okay. So yeah. that if you're sitting, your head is above the, uh, is above that. Yeah, but well, the, but the and, 55 and the people, inch television will go above. Oh, well that the bracket there is kind of the, the like holds on to the middle of the television. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's all uh, below your, like face and line of sight if you're sitting in a normal chair. Uh, but okay. since we're in a table going around like this, we can look down to see that and then look up to that's see right. I just want to make sure the audience can still see the people sitting there. Right. And that's one of the reasons why we thought if there's an audience there, it might be that not everybody can see that screen if the room is packed. That's why getting the new projector was a good idea because then you can project the same thing on the wall uh, up high where uh, everybody can see it. And we move it so that the projector is not projecting in the selectman's eyes the way it is now, but move it so that it's actually going to project onto one of the darker walls and move the screen over to that wall. Okay. And what's the thing, and what's the thing that looks like the combination of a Alexa and a penguin? On the owl. Left side? owl. Oh, that's the owl. That's the camera. Oh, it's the same family. What does it do? <laughs> 
it's got it's got the cameras and the microphones in it. And that and top it, is a little dome, a little C3PO dome, and it, and the cameras in there, yeah. and it can go 360 degrees around the room. Yeah, and it's got. Brian nice and I on this webinar saw an example of it being used, and if it works, if it's working right, it's incredibly impressive because it will focus in, it will give you a panorama of the room. It will then enable the camera to focus on whoever is speaking. Yep. And that the, it'll get, provide a two, sort of a picture in picture, two picture screen, mm -hmm. one with the panorama and one close up of the person speaking. Yeah. Why did it? George- it's working, it's, it, it was very impressive to see. Why did George Orwell suddenly pop into my mind when you described that, Fred? Um, as long as, as as long as the thing doesn't act like the the the, the robot at Stop and Shop that follows you around the store for whatever reason, I'm not sure. Mm. No, it um, follows the voice, so it okay. can get confused if too many people are talking at the same time. But. Uh, oh. Okay. But that it, it wasn't a problem in the demonstrations that I saw either. Okay. And, and so, just just a, a, a truth and cost statement here that um, if I, my recommendation is that if we go ahead and purchase this stuff, we're going to need to pay for a lock on this door because it's not currently locked, and I would not want to see this stuff walk out. So we'll have to tighten our mm -hmm. uh, okay. controls on the room and and. Okay. Maybe, yeah, figure some stuff out. And we'll, we're also going to have to probably um, give tutorials and primers to people who um, are okay. holding meetings in that room on how to yep. use it. And that's one of the benefits of this is that it, it's- It is really simple. Fairly simple to use. Okay. Yeah. Then I, I'm going to take the liberty of making a motion to accept this proposal to pay for this, this uh, these pieces of communication infrastructure. And I will add to that, that um, it, it will be paid out of uh, peg access uh, budgets that, that the town of Whitley currently has uh, in its war chest. I would second that. All those in favor, Fred. Yes. Joyce. Aye. Me, yep. Okay. And if we can, If we can also authorize Brian to look into what would be necessary for the security implications for the room. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't think that requires a vote, but yeah, I, I No, agree. that's just a suggestion that we get that moving. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, next on the hit parade is um, that's Awesome. And now we're on to new business. Um, draft request for interest, ideas, and innovation for the Waitley Center School. Brian, let's get it out there. Yeah, I, th I thought it was pretty good. Yeah. There was one, I think I sent one uh, possible typo into Brian by email. I think mean, like 650 feet was supposed yes. to be there, but just said 650. That's, I read through the whole thing. I thought it was uh, very well written and put together and easy to understand and yeah. great. So, great. so my recommendation is that is that we we sent out the draft for, uh, um, I guess till the next select board meeting. Um, I think we might have some interested people that may want to provide some comments on the actual RFI itself. Thinking of the of the visioning committee or folks on the visioning committee, historical society um, planning board may want to may want to provide some comments on it. Oh. Um, I'll tell you a lot of this was, and I, I, I would just want to say how great the center school visioning report was because a lot of <laughs> what I put in this is uh -huh. <coughs> cut and basted from that report. Um, it, it, it was tremendously helpful. Obviously the, this is, uh, the format is borrowed from other communities who have done the same things with, with schools, but, um, I think it'll it it provides a, a formal and transparent process for the board to to find out what others may have in mind for the school if it was to become available, right. and I think that's an important important piece of information that we don't currently have. No. Uh, in terms of so in terms of the process, we the RFI goes out and we we solicit 
letters of interest and, and ideas. And then the, the board would decide um, whether it wants to put out an RFP and what the terms of, so the RFP meaning the request for proposals as to what uh, the request for proposals asks for. Um, it may help the board narrow down. It may like a concept or an idea for the center school. And we may, it, the board may choose to limit the RFP to that, um, but it helps us figure out sort of what direction to go to. And, and what's the, the scope of distribution on this? Um, so that's, that's a good question. Uh, I, I don't know. Um, what do we want to do? I think we want to send this near and far to the four corners. Um, I would send it to property management companies. I would send it to anyone who wants to read it. I don't know how to do that. I, I'm not saying that, but, but, you know, why wouldn't you send it to, I, I, this, is an, this is an example. It's not a good one to, to a Boston properties because these people know what market demand is out there. They know what infrastructure is needed for different uses and purposes. Um, I, I just think we need to maximize the distribution and, and not keep this Waitley's little secret. Yeah, I agree. I think the, the idea of this is to get as many ideas in as we possibly can. So there are, you know, there are property managers out there um that might be interested in seeing this i i don't know i yeah i don't have a good clear idea of where to post this either but it, it it should but it's not just for the greenfield recorder all due respect to the greenfield recorder right There may be a, a board of realtors that would be interested in advertising this as well. And the other thing I like to suggest, some point in the process, Brian, uh, I think it's important to have uh, information meeting for town residents, either after you get response here or a response from the RFP before the board, I guess, decides what way to go. I, I think this is, is a significant building in the center of town. And I think we need to afford all the people in town an opportunity to comment on it. And I think the best way to do that is at a, a public information meeting. You know, we've done it for other major projects. You did it for the, the uh, complete streets program. We, we, other, other things we've, we've done as well, so. Yeah, in the RFI, it, it, it uh in terms of the process, once once the board receives concepts, and hopefully we receive a lot of them, who knows, um, that they would weed out the ones that are maybe too pie in the sky, and then and then have a public meeting about about those concepts and, and that were received a, a public meeting about those concepts that were received, and more generally about about uh, what an RFP might 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 include. And and we should in, we should invite the 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 people who gave birth to the different concepts. To, to, to attend the yep. public meetings. All right. Okay. Yep. It, it's going to be in terms of, I mean, what do we want to do in terms of the length of time that it's out? I guess I was, I mean, two weeks is too short. Um, I don't know if a month is too short. Two months, uh, if we're asking for sort of sketch plans and ideas, I mean, does that take two months, three months? I mean, what do we think? In three months, you start to you start to mess around with the holidays. I, I think right. it needs to be done by the middle of October. Okay. Personally, I mean that's just my opinion, but yeah. So, are we okay if I send this around to the different boards and committees and ask for ask for their input with the idea that at the the board's meeting on August, whatever our next one is, twenty fifth. Um, that we would uh, review any changes and then have it out by the end of the month. Yeah. Okay. I'm good. You guys? Well, I, I think if, if we're getting this out by the end of the month, then maybe give it two months, so end of October, as a projected return date. Rather than just, I think six weeks may be too short. 
I, I, that's fine. I think I think I I think that people who are worth their salt can get it turned around that quickly. But end of October is fine. I'm also trying to sort of build in an, like a couple of extra weeks to try to get more distribution of it. Yeah. Not okay. not assuming that anyone who wants to see it's going to see it immediately. Right. Well, and we may come up with a, we may we may brainstorm new delivery methods that didn't come into our heads out of the gate. So that's good. Yeah. Mm. So I think building in a couple of weeks for that would be worthwhile. Okay. Okay. Let's move on then to. Oh, we get to appoint a representative to the Franklin Regional Transit Authority Advisory Board. Who was it previously, Brian? It was Fred. I think it was Fred previously. It doesn't have to be a select board member, does it? Um, I would, no, it doesn't have to be. I would nominate Brian. Domina. I'm not here in a second. Do you have capacity to do that, Brian? What's that? Do you have capacity to do that? I actually think it would be, Brian, how about, hey, Joyce, how about interim Brian, but it's a perfect, perfect job for the um, community development administrator assistant position, whoever fills that vacancy. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, that, uh, as long as that's uh, legally allowed, I think if their title says town administrator in it somewhere, then that might be legal. Why From what Brian's summary email said, it made me think it either has to be town administrator or a selectman. So, I mean, I've sat on that advisory board, and and maybe I'm maybe I didn't scan the room closely enough, but I don't think that everyone was either a select board member or 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 a a, a, a town administrator, manager, coordinator. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Brian. I, uh, Jonathan, I was on be before, and and I think Richard Tillman was on a year or two ago as, as our representative. And Richard Tilburg, you mean? Till, Tilburg, yeah, on, on River Road. And Brian, I, I thought I was already uh, nominated for this position and signed a, took an oath of office with Amy here. Uh, within the last month for this position, is that no longer valid then? No. Oh. Um, I can do. Let me double check with her. Um, we just got the notice to to appoint somebody. So, right. Well, I'm reading back at the already... thing. It says the FERTA bylaws say that the chairperson or town administrator or the chair's designee is to be appointed yeah. to the FERTA advisory board. And then it, it says here that, you know, Fred was the uh, representative for fiscal 21. Um, so it sounds like that that last or the chair's designee, we actually have some flexibility here. I guess if I'm no longer the representative, somebody please let me know. So I'm, still I'm, getting, I'm still getting emails from them of the meetings that are being scheduled. So let me read the, this confusing cover letter. <laughs> it says, this is a request for the town to submit a letter stating the person that will serve as the FRTA advisory board member as defined by section 5161B and one appointed designee if desired. Section five defines advisory board member as a city manager in the case of a plan D or plan E city or the mayor of each city or town and the chairman of the board of selectmen of each town having such board or the town manager or town administrator of each other town. So to me, that says we appoint an advisory board member and then we appoint a designee. The advisory board member should either be the, the chairman of the board of selectmen or the town manager or town administrator. And then there is also the opportunity to one up to appoint a designee. It's what I'm reading right now in the, the letter that's in the packet. So it sounds to me like the advisory board member needs to be either the chairman of the select board 
or the town administrator, and the designee can be someone other than that. So you get a surrogate, essentially. So it's either Jonathan or I, and I know where that one falls. <laughs> better believe it, big guy. <laughs> and then a designee. Okay. So is there any harm in having a, a designee? It sounds like it could only help, right? Right. I, I think it's commonplace choice. Yeah. Based on my history. Then, then if we need to vote on something, would we just move the two names and vote on it? Because I would, if if I were, if I were to move, here I'll, I'll just move it. Um, I move that we uh, appoint Brian as our member and Fred Orlowski as our designee. Second. All those in favor, Fred. Yes. Joyce. Aye. Me, yep. Brian, is there any indication on that letter or any place what the term is? Like, That'd be a one year term, right? Yeah, it's saying it's the appointment for FY22, July, uh, the FY22 fiscal year. Okay. Okay. Um, vote to make an offer of employment for the administrative assistant position, Brian. Yep. So as we know, Amy moved to the, the town clerk position and she's been helping out as, as she can. Um, so we advertised for the vacancy for the 24 hour position. Um, we had a number of, of resumes that we received um, of all different sorts, as you can imagine. Um, we ended, we narrowed those down. Um, Amy and I narrowed those down to six candidates that we interviewed. Um, and our recommendation is that the board appoint uh, Brianna Willis uh, to the administrative assistant position. Um, I think that she will be the best fit for a number of reasons. Um, she has experience with in the administrative assistant role um, and also in terms of attitude and really some of the answers in the interview that she gave in terms of sometimes dealing with difficult people, um, a, a, a work record that shows a, a commitment to her job um, was also important. So, um, that's our, our recommendation to the board. I, I'd included a copy of the, the resume with the personal information redacted. Anybody have any thoughts? What's her name? Brianna, I'm sorry, I don't have it in front of me. Brianna Willis. Willis, Willis yep. She lives in Ashfield. So um, I'm hoping for Mary Allen 2.0. <laughs> yeah. Just kidding. <laughs> Um, well, that's not going to happen, but, uh, but I know. She, she looked, I mean, her experience is in, um, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's about multitasking and being a, like the front desk receptionist and technician and, you know, like any number of things you've got to do. And I, I, I think she seems, if you think she's a good choice and you've met, met her there, I don't see anything on her um, letter and resume that would make me, um, uh, double guess that. Okay. So do I hear a motion to accept? I move we accept the uh, Brianna Willis as to the administrative assistant position. A second. All those in favor? Fred? Yes. Joyce? Yes. Me? Yep. Done. Offer made. Thank um, you. And hey, Brian, we don't need to... Yeah, can we stop the share screen? Out over here. Oh, you guys want to see each other, huh? Maybe. We <laughs> maybe. We don't need to discuss salary here. No, that pay rate is is set for okay. fiscal year uh, twenty two. Okay. Um, uh, job description for the community development administrator. Assistant town administrator position. Yep. So that was included in the meeting packet. The personnel committee met on Monday night to discuss and made some uh, a few changes to the um, to some of the language. Um, we also talked about 
a uh, pay rate for the position. But before we get to that, I guess, are there any questions or comments on the on the job description? Fred, Joyce, you guys, one of you guys yep. want to kick it off? I went through it with the personnel committee. Um, there were, uh, we, we made some grammatical changes to it, but we really didn't change much. No, I looked at it, it looked good. And the, it, it really, it matches exactly what we'd always been talking about for this position to really concentrate on land use and working with boards. And I think that's really clear, but it, it's also clear that it's not exclusively those functions. Um, and I, I think it, I liked it. Right. And, and also be some, to, to be someone who will mine for grants and whatever. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm looking for someone who's found. Right. I'm looking for someone who's flexible, who, who, who just isn't going to say, you know, it's not my job description. Um, mm -hmm. I want someone who gets it. And if they have to ask the definition of what does get it mean, then you don't get it. And I know that's tough to put into a job description, but it's what I look for. Um, so as long as, as, as long as you guys feel like the yeah. job description emphasizes flexibility and, you know, being a utility player, then I'm, I'm fine. Yeah. Okay, so that doesn't require a motion though, does it, Brian? Um, yeah, it would, it would require a select board vote to approve the job description because it's, it's a new one. Okay, all right. I move that we approve the job description for the assistant town administrator. Second. All those in favor, Joyce? Aye. Fred? Aye. Me, yep. So, so the second part of this is a recommendation from the personnel committee to set the, uh, set the pay rate at, at uh, 2376. Um, so it's a 40 hour position benefited position that translates to um, $49,611 because I know Jonathan wants us to list annual, right? Based Absolutely. on the meeting yesterday. Don't um, care about hourly. Don't care at all. So that was the recommendation uh, that I provided to the personnel committee. Actually, they added a cent to it. Uh, in case there's overtime, because Keith always has fun when we give him odd numbers and he has to calculate. Um, overtime. Three, yeah, three decimal you have points to do out. Even numbers of overtime is what you got to do. Um, the number of hours. It, it was difficult to find uh, comparisons. Um, the one, the closest ones that 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 we could find, I thought were relevant, was um, there was assist, an assistant planning position in Irving that was a forty-hour week position. Um, that was 23, 23, I, I don't know if I have it written down here, 23, 25 or something like that. Uh, but he, I think even more relevant, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission is looking to hire, I think it, their job description set up to three planners and their typical entry level uh, salary is 50,000. So uh, we're really in line with that. And if I remember correctly, the budget appropriation was 55. 55,000, yeah. We'll cover whatever extra expenses will be. Yeah, yeah, if there's any extra expenses and- o Overtime uh, or whatever. Yeah, the personnel committee asked yesterday, yesterday, or they had a discussion, sorry, Monday. Mm -hmm. Yesterday was senior center meeting. Um, what happens if someone's, you know, knocks our socks off and, and we need to, and we think, in order to attract them here, we, we would need to pay them more. And but our response was, well, we'd have to come back and talk about it. I guess it would require another meeting. Um, but there is some flexibility in the budget if-, if, if Okay, okay. That. So what, so are we, does that require a motion as well, Brian? <clears throat> yep, maybe a vote to set the pay rate. All right, what do I hear? Um, I move that we set the pay rate at $23.76 an hour for this job. Second. All those in favor, Joyce? Aye. Fred? Aye. Me, yep. All right, Brian, um, you've got 15 minutes because I have a meeting at 8 o'clock. Wow. Ooh. It's just like it's just like posting 40. I'm going to take up all I can posting this meeting at 40. Welcome to my world. <laughs> Um, 
I assume the answer is yes, but I want to make sure Western Mass Food Bank is having their bike for food event on September 26th. Um, they usually set up a water station out on the lawn here. Sometimes they use a portable toilet. They've always, it's always not, it has not been a problem. I assume that's fine again. And I assume, Jim, they've talked to you about details. Or they will. Yes. Yep. There's a request in. Okay. Um, I think we've got that taken care of already. So. Okay. So I assume the water stop is fine here to the, for the board. Yeah. Okay. Um, we have one, uh, just a reminder, we have a, a vacancy on the cultural council. Um, Julie Wagner termed out, she did her three years. Um, so if we have anybody or have any ideas for somebody to appoint at the next meeting or whenever, um, if somebody could pass us along. To, to the people of Waitley, it's one of the easier volunteer positions around because you get to give away money and make friends. There's really no downside, and they don't meet very often. Mm -hmm. So that uh, so there's a vacancy there, um, as was um, announced in the recorder. The uh, the senior center director has resigned her position, and the board of oversight will be uh, looking to fill that position. I think that advertisement will go out. I think in the next day or two. I believe Jonathan, right? Yep. Um, so there'll be an advertisement for that. It's a 40 hour, 40 hour week position. Um, it's a challenging position, uh, but there's a vacancy. So if um, folks are interested in that, um, they can pay attention to the town website for the posting and it'll be posted in the newspapers as well. Energy, energy, energy. Yeah. I, yep. It's, sometimes it's difficult dealing with one town. I can't imagine dealing with three. Right. Um, Wait, what do you mean it's difficult dealing with one town? Oh, did I say that out loud? <laughs> <laughs> all right, you've got 13 minutes. You going to use it all? Oh. No. Oh. We can. You can You can go get some coffee or something before your next meeting. Get, get dinner before 8 o'clock, yeah. Wait, it's a oh. dinner meeting? No, it's not a dinner meeting. I have to run to my kitchen and get something to eat before I, and the meeting will go probably till 9.30 or 10, so. Mm. Well, then I would move that we adjourn this meeting. I would second that. All right, then by edict, we don't need to even vote. I'm saying meeting adjourned. Uh-oh, there goes the open meeting law. <laughs> Thank you. Good night, Good night. you guys. Good night.